Um, a little bit of background while we're waiting for that to come up. I've been going to the Dominican Republic for about 10 years. And I've shared before since the very first time that I visited there that I fell in love with the island and the people. And it's almost inexplicable, except that I can explain it. It's God who put a passion inside of me to serve the people and to love the people of the island with his love. Every year my experiences are varied and different, whether I'm in one of the cities, up in the mountains, or in the Campo, which is what they call the country there. But there's one common denominator is that no matter where I am, God always shows up Amen. in very remarkable ways. So here is our first day of ministry. I'm going to kind of go chronologically and then backtrack a little bit. Okay. So this is a feeding program in Garabo. And every time we go there, we work with local churches. So they feed children every day, and we did a short program with them. This is my first team of missionaries when I went with, with, with Pastor Jim in Santiago. And we did a short program and just hung out with the kids, and then we helped feed the kids. And I did not steal their food. It was just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Although the, the kid who I took it from, I said, one minute, one minute. Um, she was a little scared. <laughs> That night we went to a local church with Pastor Jim and I was asked to give a testimony. So this is me and Marilyn who was one of our translators. And I've been learning Spanish for a number of years. I can carry on a conversation pretty well one-on-one. -on -one. I'm very comfortable. However, I am not comfortable speaking in Spanish in front of large groups. So take note of the translator because this is important later in the story. Okay. The next day we took the ministry truck. And this truck, you can't really see, but there's Tim and Trina Johnson who have been missionaries in, down in the DR for about 18 years. And he took a box truck and converted it to a ministry truck. So that's actually a box truck that it folds out into a stage. It has an awning, it has a full wow. puppet stage, a sound system, and a puppet stage and lights. So we can use it in the day and night. So it's, it's an incredible tool, and this is the first time we got to use it. So we did puppet songs, dances, and dramas for the kids. That's the group of kids that was there that day. And afterward, we gave out some toys and just loved on them a little bit before it was time to go. And when we left, we left in my favorite mode of Dominican transportation, which is usually a Toyota pickup. Oh. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty rare to be able to ride like that. Um, normally, we run in air-conditioned buses, but that was a treat, at least for me. That's air-conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> Plus. Okay, so that night... We took um, the, the truck to the streets of Santiago, and they were able to get permits, and literally what you do is you pull up the truck and you block off a street, and we set up a whole bunch of plastic chairs wow. um, with permission from the government. They actually allow this and, in fact, encourage it, and we were able to do a program that night. Um, the next morning, oh, that's us doing dramas, and that's kind of, let me get to show you how to use it. Oh, not that one. Hold on back. Okay, so that's Conrad. And he's actually a Nicaraguan who's been living in the Dominican Republic and he's serving under Pastor Tim and Trina Johnson because he was in jail. Um, he's an American, but he was uh, Nicaraguan by birth. He was in jail in the United States. They deported him back to Nicaragua. The U.S. won't let him back in, even though he lived here 25 years, so he's serving the Lord there, waiting to be able to get back into the United States, which hopefully will happen soon, if it's the Lord's will. But he was an amazing man of God. The next morning, we went to a local church, and our team leader, Thais, uh, shared the word. That's a couple people from our team at the church. No. Yes. Later that day, Thais, who was our team leader, she shared something with me. She said that, I don't think you need a translator anymore, Jen. And she said, and in fact, I forbid it. And I said, well, you're just mean. <laughs> and I said, but I'm, I'm going to thank you and hug you for stretching me. Later on that day, she shared with me that I would be giving my testimony that night in Spanish. And I did not hug her anymore, nor did I say thank you. <laughs> so, okay. there I am that night, and there I am being stretched. We go into the church, and I see there was somewhere between 150 people, maybe 1,000. It wasn't important. There were a lot of people. <laughs> So it must have been something pretty good. Praise the Lord. Okay. This is 
uh, John Cruz. He's, he's a local who serves under Pastor Tim and Trina Johnson, and he travels with us a lot. And you just saw the smile on his face. He's like that all the time. <laughs> and he's a pleasure to work with. He's actually in Nicaragua serving as a missionary. He's raising money to go to somewhere in West Africa. I want to say Ghana, but I'm not sure. Um, right now that he's in Nicaragua for three months, but um, we set out with sacks of, that's rice and beans there, yeah. and the local pastor had identified many needy families in the area, so we went house to house, and we had some helpers helping us carry the rice and beans, because the bags of rice were 10 pounds each, and they got heavy as we're oh, yeah. them around. This was a very, very poor area, I'll just leave some of the houses up for you to see. And there you can see the little, there's two little boys there playing and nothing but their undies. And that's a very, very common sight there. Okay. That night, oh, actually, get in the hang of this. Um, I just wanted to share a story. Conrad, who I showed you before, before we set out to feed the people, he said there's a house and there's a man there and he had been in a terrible accident years before. And he's blind, and he said, I want you to stop, we'll a couple of you get off the van and pray for him. So I said, sure. And um, there was a man sitting outside of the house, very similar to the ones that you saw, is sitting in a chair, and he was blind from the accident. And he had something like a hematoma. I'm not exactly sure what it was. I actually looked him up on the internet to try to identify. But whatever happened to him when he fell, he had hideous disfiguration on his face, his eye, and his neck. And... Um, I knew I would cry at this part. So he asked us to pray for him. And there were uh, three of us, Victoria and um, Nilsa, who are uh, Hispanic. Latina, actually, is the correct term. And they were praying for him, and I was praying with them, but they were doing the talking because I can't really pray that fast in Spanish. So, you know, but I was happy to be a part of it, laying hands on him. And God said, clear as day, hug him. And he was not attractive. And you have all these thoughts running through your mind, and if I touch it, is it bad? Is it and I, and I just heard say, hug him. So I just knelt down and put my arms around him. And God just gave me the words to speak, just to communicate how very much he was loved by God. And later when we were talking, I just, I, well, when I hugged him, I just felt God's love, like, literally travel right through me, and I knew it had been a very long time since he had had a hug. So that was one place God showed up big time. Wow. Okay. There. Um, let's see. No, I can't see. Okay. <laughs> that night we were to head out for another street service in Santiago, and what we do is when you pull up, um, you pull up the van gets all set up, the truck gets all set up, and those of us who weren't part of that, we go house to house and we invite people. So we went all through the town, we go for about a half an hour. The kids start following you like the Pied Piper, so you can see many kids um, showed up that night, and there were hundreds of people. And I used to have shared with me that that night I would be sharing again, and there was, I don't know, maybe 200 people in the crowd. So we did our songs there, and I'm not much of a singer, so when it's the praise and worship going on, you usually won't see me <laughs> on stage. Um, I did participate in a drama, which was a lot of fun, and then it was my turn to speak, and I want to show you what God did. See that lady? It's like a woman I don't even know. When I saw that picture, I asked someone, can you take a few shots of me when I'm up there? And what happened, I was talking, again, I couldn't tell you what I said, I have literally no recall, except I knew I gave an altar call, and at that point I remember I was pointing to the children, because they were all gathered in the front. And I went down off the stage, and there were probably eight or ten kids, and they just pressed in towards me, and they all gave their hearts to Jesus that night. And I love sharing with people, whenever anybody accepts the Lord, I love to say, do you know that the Bible says in Luke 15, that the angels rejoice in heaven when someone gives their hearts to the Lord. Amen. When I tell the kids in Dominican Republic, I tell them, are there tissues up here? Oh, yes. Sorry. I said, but, but when I tell the kids down there, I say there's a, a big fiesta, a gigantic fiesta, and all the angels are there, and the kids just got so wide eyed and they're looking up, like, this, this is amazing. And I said, and there's this big book, there's this giant book. 
and God wrote your name in it. It's, it's in there, so when you get to heaven, you're going to see your name. And they just looked up, and, and you could tell that they really received it. And that was that was probably one of the highlights of the trip for me. So the next step. Thank you. which is kids club and there were about 250 kids there that day and it was a very um, special day because school had just ended it was the first one normally it's on Saturdays during the school year this one was on a Wednesday so we had the songs and the dramas and the testimonies but because it was the end of school they had asked all the kids to bring their report cards so you can see just a lot a lot of kids in the audience the, the room holds about 500 and then afterwards, we took pictures of the boys. All the boys came up and held their report cards, and then the little girls came up and held their report cards, which, as a teacher, that was special for me that they were so proud. Yeah. And the next day, well, that's at the end, um, they were told also if they brought their report cards that they got a special treat at the end, so everybody's getting <laughs> their goodies on their way out. <laughs> also wanted to point out, um, this is Veronica, and I don't see Allie in the picture, but. Um, Veronica was my student when she was in fourth grade. She's uh, in tenth grade now at my school, and she came along with me, along with her girlfriend, um, Allie, and they served on the field with us. Amen, Mom. So, okay, that night, our team returned to the streets in, in the truck for another night of ministry. So there's us. Um, we work with local churches, so this was a drama some people in the local church put on. And that's it. Marilyn, who is the star of one of our dramas. And that's the ministry going on that night. So the next day we went to Parque Central, which I'll translate in English for you to Central Park. In case you didn't catch that. <laughs> it's a beautiful park. As you can see, the park is just teeming with people, and they're passing through all day long. So it's really an ideal place for ministry. I've probably been there three or four times in years prior. Thais had asked me to share again, and it was a very long program because what we do is we go there for hours and we just work with local churches and we just put on songs and dramas and have testimonies and so you have plenty of time to get worked up and get really nervous. But I just kept saying, God, you have to show up. I'll, I'll stand there. I'll hold the mic and you know, you you fill my words and and he he did it again. So look at me and God go. I mean, I grabbed up the picture because I'm just. Uh, you can tell I'm saying something. <laughs> I'm not even Italian. <laughs> Actually, when I talk in Spanish, I do move my hands a lot. So that was some of the ministry that went on, so some of the members of our team. Okay, so that night, we took back to the streets. It was our final night of street ministry, so we did a full program with praise and worship. Okay, if you look very carefully, see those two puppets in the corner? Those are mine. <laughs> on this side. And puppets are a lot of fun, but has anybody here ever done puppets? Okay, how hard tired do your arms get after a three minute song? <laughs> it's a good thing the songs are blasting because you're actually screaming for the music to stop just so you can rest your arms before the next one comes on. But it is a lot of, a lot of fun. You get a little choreography going on. You can see after the puppets we did our songs and our drama testimonies and the Holy Spirit really showed up. This picture is really blurry, but you can see what God did. I mean, these are people pulled from the streets. This is not a church service. This is in the middle of the street in inner city Santiago. So, a day later, I went to, I took a bus from Santiago, which is in the central part of the country, down to Santo Domingo, and Samantha Brandy flew in, and I met her there. My friend Rafaelito picked us up. Oh, actually, sorry, that's a Haitian family that I prayed for at that night service, and for those of you who don't know, Haiti and Dominican Republic are on the same island, and because of, even before, prior to the earthquake, a lot of nations came over this, to the Dominican Republic for a better life, because even though it's a poor country, Haiti is really destitute, so there are millions and millions, they don't really know exactly how many Haitians there are exactly in the country, but um, that was a family that I ministered to that night. Okay, so now we're getting to, okay. So I took the bus to Santo Domingo, met Sam at the airport, and she and I stayed in San Cristobal, which is about a half an hour outside the capital. 
and my friend Gail lives there. She, she and I started traveling together on the mission fields probably about 10, 12 years ago. Gail had been there a few years prior. Gail actually lives there now. She's an American who's transported her life there, and she's a pastor, and we stayed with her. She took us to Pacta de Gracia Orphanage, and Sam's going to talk a lot more about the orphanage, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but these are some of the young ladies who are there. next day. This is my friend Milagros, and she's a lovely woman who attends the church that Gail has. She does a children's program at her house every Saturday, so Sam and I just went to have some fun with the kids. And this is Milagros has a son who is an American, so he's able to help provide for her, so she actually has a beautiful home, and this is her backyard and her garden, and she has a space big enough for probably 40, 50 kids come every week, depending on the week. Then the next morning, the next day was Sunday, so we got to go to Gail's church, and I can't for the life of me remember the name of it. I just call it Gail's church, I think. So, <laughs> but they have two services in the morning, one for the kids, so we got to go and participate with them, and that's the uh, song and a lot of hand motions and things, and then they do some coloring before the grown-ups arrive. Gail had asked me to share the word, and there's Sam. <laughs> okay. And this is me. And Francisco, who is my translator, because he all had not been told that I had been And I did not tell him. She did. She knew, but I was actually, the other times I was testifying, this time I was actually teaching the word, so I felt far more comfortable in English. And Francisco and I had worked together um, for years. And it was good that they let me use a translator, because later that night I spoke at the Haitian church, and I don't speak but a word of Creole, I know one word of Creole, and it's Jay-Z, which is Jesus, and that's it. But um, I just want you to note the conditions as you see the, the picture in the Haitian church. And this is the bass player, and he's sitting on a sack of three or four bags of cement when he plays. Wow. This is the local pastor, Minig. I've known him for about five years. So um, Peterson was translating for me. Any time there was a scripture to be read, Minig did that, so it was a team effort. But they were so enthusiastic before I even finished sentences. They were praising the Lord, yelling out, calling out. So it was a really a lot of fun to minister there. In both the morning service and the evening service, a lot of people came forward for ministry. You can see that's, pardon me, that's the pastor's wife. Her name is Merlandi. They have, I think, seven or eight children. I've known them for probably three or four years. And then this young lady gave her heart to the Lord that night. Praise God. Okay, the next day, Sam and I left to meet our team in Santo Domingo. So we were just the two of us by ourselves in San Cristobal for a couple of days. The next day, we met up with Pastor Jim and a team, and it was team from, they were from um, different areas in New York State for the most part. And one of the things we did, this is Carolina and Pedro Cruz, Carolina Cruz de Martinez and Pedro Martinez's foundation. I go there and offer there that she was talking about when she visited. And we were there in the perfect week because they were holding a kids' camp with 350 kids a day. And we got to work there um, two full days and two sessions. They had the younger kids in the morning. I think it was ages 5 to 9 in the morning, 5 to 10, and then 11 and up to teenagers later that day. So again, Sam's going to talk about this portion a little bit, so I'm not going to go too far into it. But you can just see the kids. Um, we just had, I think I had more fun than the kids there. We, we sang. We, I taught them how to do the wave, we danced, we did all kinds of dramas. It was 90 degrees, we were playing American songs, we were playing Spanish songs. Uh, Pastor Shelley, you guys know Pastor Shelley, that woman can dance, ask her about it. And Sam and I spent some time being drama queens, there we are. <laughs> Acting our dramas together. And this is also the place when we collected the books. Uh, the money for the books here, and oh, then yeah. my school collected the books uh -huh. as well. This is where we brought the books to, and there's wow. some of the kids in the books. And I wanted to give a shout out to all my friends, colleagues, and students, and former students from Haldane who are over there in the back. And this is our team dividing up medicine. When we do medical missions, we bring a lot of medicine from the, from the states. Most of it is just over the counter. It's not that they don't have it there. It's just that people can't afford it. So we spend some time putting 
just different things, you know, stomach remedies, pain reliever, children's fever, all kinds of um, drugs. So what we do is we divide it up into small bags, enough for, you know, maybe 30 pills, it depends what it is, and vitamins, another important thing. So that's what it looks like when you're preparing for a, a medical mission. It takes two or three evenings of breaking up medicines like that to prepare. We did two medical missions. The first was at an orphanage, but it's a very small orphanage that only has eight kids right now because they're waiting to finish the second floor. But what the pastor did, Pastor Anna, she invited the community in. And these are the children from the community that you see here. And their parents were waiting in the back to be seen at the clinic. But we knew that there would be a lot of kids there, so we planned a children's program. Um, I, I counted in the picture, there's 50 plus kids there. So we did a children's program for them, and then we just had some time, there's kids getting, getting into it. And this is on the other side, we were on one side of the building, on the other side of the building, this is where the clinic was going on. And then the kids just, they didn't, they didn't leave all day, we were there at 9 in the morning, and we stayed until actually dinner time. Wow. Wow. Uh, they fed us, and then we went to the church service that night. And it was just some of the, the families that were waiting. We had some of the missionaries <coughs> Those were some kids who were outside. And these are some of the young ladies at the orphanage. That's four of them. So, when I looked at this picture of last night and I was preparing my notes, God reminded me of what he says true religion is, which is James 1.27. And it says, religion that... I don't know how this gets me every time. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this to look after. Orphans and widows. Mm -hmm. Look after orphans and widows. Okay. I never really like it when people call me religious. And a lot of people do at work or just people who know me say, oh, oh wow, you're so religious, that's so nice. And I never like it. And I say, I'm not religious, I just love Jesus. But according to the Bible, when I read this, I said, maybe I am religious after all. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm reminded as I reflect on the the weeks that I spent there, how, how faithful God is. Because I want to show you what he did. He's faithful to his word. Because that's me. And that's me. And that's me. And God together. Amen. Because with God, you can do things you never thought you could do before. Amen. Yes. So, Sam Brandy is going to come up next. Thank you. 
didn't even know how many girls. I didn't know what it was for. I wasn't really sure what was going on. Um, and he actually gave me the design for the bracelets. As you can see, every single one has two different colors, but none of them have red beads. And the every single one, well, they all do have red beads, but in the regular design, they don't. But if you see, actually, there's one here. Every single one has two red beads right next to the charm. And he actually gave me this design. He wanted every single one to have these two red beads to signify the blood. And, um, and so when he told me about it, I was like, oh, okay, I'll do that. And I was, kept procrastinating it because I was like, well, I need to learn Spanish. That's my first priority. I'm going to a Spanish-speaking country. How am I going to talk about you, Jesus, if I can't speak their language? So for two days, I went to Starbucks, and I had absolutely annoyed to studying. Like, I was going to be fluent in a week. I was so excited. And then I went back the third day, and there was a block. I, I couldn't, I literally couldn't study at all. And so I'm like, Satan, I break you off my mind, and mind binding spirits, and you know me. I'm like, what's that? I called bro. I'm like, I can't take this. Satan won't leave me alone. And then I'm like, okay, wait a second. Like, God, you definitely anointed this two days ago. If you wanted to today, you would. And so I was driving, actually, because I needed to calm down and try to figure out what's going on. And I actually heard the Lord, and I never heard him speak to me this way. And I clearly heard him say to me, Samantha, did I ask you to make first, did I ask you to speak Spanish, as I said? Did I ask you to speak Spanish? And I was like, no. And I was like, did I ask you to make bracelets? I was like, yes, Lord. Like, then make the bracelets. And I was like, okay. <laughs> if I wanted you to learn Spanish, I could. You see what I did before? I was like, you're right. Oh, my gosh. So when I started making them, I had no idea what a project it was. And he really, um, he really had to talk to me about it because, you know, to us in our culture, like, we're so used to Christian stuff. Like, we go on Facebook and it's just constant, constant scripture. This person speaking, this um, person singing. We have it on TV, we have Christian radio, and over there, it's not like that. And it's not every day, it's rarely that somebody shows up at your orphanage. It's a, it's, it's a life thing. It's, a, it's an event for them. And to have something like this is not something small. To us, we just add it to our collection of Christian things that we've gained along this conference or this or that. Mm -hmm. To them, yeah, you know, the Lord just showed me a picture of literally these girls wearing it every single day, like sleeping with the little, I, I made little cards, sleeping with the little cards next to them, reading it every single night. And I was humbled. I was like, wow, who am I to say what's well, not a big deal, you know? Because obviously this was a big deal to him. So this, they all had different charms. There's five different charms, and this one says be yourself. Um, and then with each bracelet, I, the Lord gave this to me, because I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, once I started on it, he gave me exactly what he wanted me to have each one say. And there were little cards. I'll just read this one really quick. This one says to be yourself. Be yourself in English is... English for be yourself because it would have been in Spanish if that makes sense. Um, Song of Solomon 4, 6 through 7 in the Bible says, You're beautiful from head to toe, my dear love, beautiful beyond compare, absolutely flawless. Jesus is saying this about you. Wear this bracelet to remind you that you do not need to compare yourself to anyone or try to be like anyone else. Jesus says, You are perfect. The two red beads stand for the blood of Jesus, which represents his love for you. Jesus loves you so much that he died for you so that you could be forgiven of every single sin and could live forever with him. As you wear your bracelet, remember that he guides and protects you, and he's with you always. Wow. So actually, all five of them, there was be yourself, love, inspire, imagine, and follow your heart. And they all ended up exactly like this, in the same structure, with the scripture, and then the next thing talked about, like, how wear your bracelet to remind you of something. And then it all ended with, um, it all ended, well, this is another one right here. This was the back, on the back of every single one, it says, this special bracelet was handmade by your friends, Samantha and Jesus, just for you. Take good care of your bracelet so you can wear it for years. Try not to get it wet. When you take it off, put it back in the pretty bag it came in to keep it protected. Enjoy it. Jesus loves you. And that's the, that's the finished product. And when it finished, I cried. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, Lord, I am so sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize this was a big deal to you. And I prayed over every single one, and I was like, Praying the anointing on them all and power over them to break whatever off of them. So this was all of them. There's three different sizes. So 
This was when I arrived, which I'm Dominican. And this, the first day we went to the orphanage. So this is me. Actually, the Lord gave me a whole message to speak. And then uh, I translated the whole thing in Spanish and spoke the whole thing in Spanish. So um, this was me speaking the message. Um, sorry. Okay, so this is me handing out the bracelets. This is them reading the cards. I'll try and this These two girls were awesome. They laughed at my message. They understood my humor. That was cool. <laughs> <laughs> and this little girl kind of missed the whole thing, but when I, at the end, I went up to her and gave her one. And then this is how I'll try them on. This was an amazing shot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then we went to the church that Jen was talking about, and um, this was the first church that I was asked to sing at. And then the kind of a little testimony about um, this is that I had not sang in the Christian realm. I sang before I got saved, but um, I just laid it down, and I laid it down, and I laid it down, and I never picked it up. And then God has me pick it up in the Dominican Republic in a different language, so... That was pretty intense. And then not only that, but I didn't have my voice, and I stepped out of faith, as you guys know, and I started, and my voice came back. So this is the first time I did it. And um, you saw this one. And then this was the Haitian church, which was, um, as you can see, as Jen was saying, the conditions were really rough. It was very frustrating because there's just so much you wish you could do. And really, besides praying, you know, it's just, God, there's got to be more. Your glory has to be coming. Your power has to be coming. Something's got to be coming. Um, so this is me having to sing again and a little nervous. And that was a shot that she got. And then this was actually us praying. This was the first time in the Dominican that I prayed on an altar team for anybody. So that was also a huge testimony because I didn't know what to do, but I knew God did. And I knew that it's not by power or by might, but by the Spirit of God. So I went up, and I literally was a vessel. I literally felt the power of God. I could not believe the things that were being prayed. I couldn't believe the power I was feeling. I, I couldn't believe just being able to be used. I mean, I was always the one going up for prayer. <laughs> and then now God's taking me to another country, and people are coming to me, and I'm saying words to them. And it's just amazing what His Spirit does. So then we met up the following day, as you see, this was when we were dispensing uh, medications. This is me and Pastor Al having a very intense conversation. <laughs> and then the next day, actually, when we met when we met up with Pastor Jim, I didn't even know Pastor Jim knew I could sing. And I was like, every time I step out in faith, it's really nervous. It's very nerve-wracking. And I don't like it. It's, it's very nerve-wracking. But I do it. But this time. Pastor Jim was like, can you sing? And I'm like, ah. And I was giving him all these excuses. Like, I really can't sing. My voice is totally gone. I thought he understood. And then we got to a church, and I had no idea it was a nice church because I had been to a lot of, like, they were very run-down churches that we had gone to. So next thing I know, here I am. I'm, like, trying to hide in the back. And he called me up again, and I didn't have my voice, and he laid hands on me, and I literally felt the power of God come, and my voice came back. Again, oh it was amazing. Just time after time, God came through. This is Pastor Caroline. It's such a cute picture of her. Um, and then we went to Aquadera and Aquadera. And this is Carolina Martinez right here introducing all of us. This was a skit that we did, which is called The Sin Chair, where um, Jen was stuck to the chair. It was, <laughs> it was, yeah, it was a bondage chair. And then I came by with the Bible, and I prayed with her, and it was the only way she was able to get up. She kept trying to get off of it, and... Everything she did, she got more stuck, drinking, smoking. Um, these are the kids there. These are the best kids in the world at this place. I don't know why, but they are. Yeah. They're amazing. Um, and then here's another shot. Um, oh, this was amazing because I was asked to sing there, and um, I didn't know what to sing in Spanish, but all I sang was the song. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. And we just sat and did it with them. And all I just kept saying was, Jesus. And all these kids, there was probably 200 kids, just saying, Jesus. Oh, and I literally, like, stood up. It's amazing, because I, I, I stood up, and I, could, I, was, I started going like this. 
pushing up like their frames. It was just the most, it was just such a beautiful sound. It was very powerful. Um, then the next day we went to an orphanage, another orphanage, and this is Jen doing her thing. She's so good at leading. And then this is us worshiping. This was the girls obsessed with my phone thing. My phone. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what is that? What is that? What is that? I'm like, oh, that's my bedroom. It's really pretty. I'm sorry. <laughs> I felt really bad. Um, so this was the next day when we went to Aquan and Aquan there. These are just some pictures of that. This is another skit we did, which was really cool. It was called Super Copy Time. And basically, like, Super Copy Time is the hero, like Superman. And in this skit, Erica was playing with the ball, and I was a boy, and I came and took the ball and pushed her around. And then Super Copy Time came and saved her. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is actually Pastor Jim's son, and he was actually sin. And Super Copy Time, he was somebody who was just covered in sin, and Super Copy Time came to save him and couldn't. So Super Copy Time was asking for help, and then Jesus came. Oh, that's really, really <laughs> awesome. It was very awesome. I was like, should I show the video? Um, this is my favorite little girl. Um, she was so sweet. She asked me to be her mom. And, and I told her I couldn't do that. <laughs> she was adorable. So this is in between sessions. There's, um, there are about two and a half, three hour sessions. And it's 98 degrees, no air conditioning. And you're literally jumping, running, shouting, everything for like three hours, full exertion. And then there's like an hour break, and then there's a whole other session. And this is just another testimony to God's power because I this was me. I was just like, there's no way. I'm done. There's just no way. And I just was like, Lord, you said those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. You know, mount up on wings like eagles. They were running that through. They were walking that way, and I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And they walked in, and literally the second they walked in, it was like a wave. It just came, and here we were dancing, and I can. I definitely was exhausted at the end of the day, but it all came back again, which was amazing. And then this day, actually, these were, this is the older group, and this day I was asked to share my testimony for the first time. Um, so that was really nerve-wracking because I never shared my testimony before, and I don't even think many of you know about it here, but um, uh, I was, when I was 12 years old, I was put on antidepressants by my parents which started off just a really bad childhood in life, basically. Um, I was bulimic for 10 years. I was addicted to anxiety pills, um, painkillers, muscle relaxers, ADD pills, smoking, smoking weed, drinking. That's just a small amount of it. I was diagnosed with severe fibromyalgia after I became a Christian. Um, so I got off of everything, which was hard to do, and then I became diagnosed with fibromyalgia. I got put back on everything. And then the Lord saved me from that when I was basically crippled. Um, so that was very nerve-wracking because I never shared my testimony. I didn't really know what I was going to say. And I didn't even plan on what I was going to say. I tried to, and I just couldn't. I couldn't even. I was just like, okay, I know God, but you do by now. So I, I got up there, and I said, you know what? I was I was in the music industry before I became a Christian. And I, I know what the youth is like, you know, and, and I know that music is just, music. Everybody loves music. And so I, I really knew that if I could present my testimony with a song and just bring the presence of God first and just get them in ready, get their hearts ready for my testimony, that it would probably be very, a lot more powerful to them. It would probably hit them. So this is me singing um, Natalie Grant, um, Your Great Name. And then this is me hearing my testimony. I don't know if you can see my eyes. That was the Holy Spirit. I was like, totally covered in the Holy Spirit. I don't even know how I, like Jen said, what I was saying. And then at the end of it, um, what I said right at the end was something along the lines of, and he set me free of every addiction, every something, every something. And the last thing I said was, he set me free. And it just struck me when I said it. Like, absolutely, like, I had no idea this was going to happen. I was just struck with the fact that I was free. And I was in the Dominican Republic, and I wasn't listening to somebody else sharing their testimony about how Jesus set them free. And I'm like, Jesus, when are you going to set me free? You know, I've been following you for this long, and, and how come you haven't set me free yet? And, like, I was the one saying it, and it was just, it, sh it just was like, real. <laughs> it was real. And the best part about it was right at the end, 
um, I started crying, bawling my eyes out, and then I had a line of kids, of the youth, about 30 or 40, maybe 50 kids line up to hug me. And it was almost like they were the ones that were healing me. <laughs> I wasn't so much, I don't know what I did, but it was a blessing. This was the next night we went to another church, and this was Erica, one of the girls on our team. This was her first time leading worship, and it was beautiful, as you can see this lady is crying in the back because it was just very anointed. Um, these were the women that ran the house, the missions house, Carol Tina's missions house. Um, they are the most amazing servants. They were so sweet. They cooked for us. They were just they made it just such a fun time. It was really good to go back to the house and have them there because it was rough out there. And then we would go back and, and they were just like, hi, how's it going? And they would do dancing for us and all sorts of things. And this was the bus that we traveled on. And this is the end. This is the end. <laughs> oh, can I say what I'm I'm sorry. I have to say my final thing that I learned. I know I'm taking a while. I apologize. This is my first time. Um, Okay, so I want to say one of something powerful that I learned was how to flow with the Holy Spirit and how to be placed in the position that He desires for me. As we approached a new mission each day, I would try to step out in different places, especially ones that I was more used to, such as singing. But the Spirit would lead me into a different, quote, battle position every single day. I knew when I came into the right place for the day because it just fit and the anointing just flowed for it. I actually learned to stand behind the scenes as an intercessor in a prayer cover, and I'd never done that before. That was very intense, quite the job, um, which I had never done. I learned to lead not just as a singer, but as an encourager. Um, and above all, I learned to be quiet and to listen to the Lord as he showed me the spiritual truth behind everything that was going on, giving me wisdom, um, teaching me which weapons to use in each battle, as well as showing me the roots to the causes of everything that I was seeing and what can be done and what I am called to do. And that this is not defeat or hopelessness, but that so much can be done to bring healing, restoration, and victory for these people into this world. And um, another thing is what I found most amazing about the children was the amount of joy and thankfulness that was in their hearts. I went there under the assumption that I had so much Jesus to give them, yet while I was there, they gave me far more than I could ever give them. And they had a joy that was contagious. They had a childlike faith that made me so excited to share more of Jesus with them because they just believed. And they had living conditions incomparable to anything I've ever experienced, yet most of them had hearts full of love to give, even if it was all they had. I realized how beyond fortunate I am and how much I truly take for granted. And lastly, I also realized how much of an impact I myself and every single one of us can make um, in their lives and in anyone's life. Yeah. Um, it's greatly increased my focus and my determination even more to bring freedom and deliverance to the world through the message of the gospel, bringing the life and the light of Jesus and his grace especially through my own life and testimony. It has increased my passion even more to declare the truth and the purpose of this life, to bring answers to questions everyone is asking in their hearts, and to be a vessel used to show God's power and glory, allowing the Holy Spirit to use me for his purposes, to set captives free, to bring healing and deliverance, and to bring hope and a future to this lost world, to show them the love that always conquers, never fails, and always wins, to introduce them to Jesus Christ, the answer, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Amen.